Uh, American Issues Take Two. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Um, and we're talking today about the extent to which Trump has sabotaged the government and his continuing effort, um, as he indicated early on, to deny uh, Joe, Joe Biden um, the power to govern um, with embedded loyalists, with missing secrets at Mar-a-Lago, and what else? Uh, so the show today with uh, our esteemed uh, co-host, uh, Tim Apicella, uh, and our esteemed uh, special guests, Stephanie Stoll Dalton and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Welcome, everybody. Morning, Jay. Morning. Thank you. So um, let me, uh, Tim, let me go to you first, not on the primary issue, but the news from the Supreme Court, because it teaches us something about the subject. What happened today? Democracy won. Uh, the system at this point has held its, it's been cobbled together and it's, it's holding. The Supreme Court denied Donald Trump's request uh, regarding the document issue. They denied it. So the DOJ will be able to retain those highly classified secret documents and the special master uh, is not entitled to review them, thus uh, delaying the whole process. Yeah, I think the magic word is delay. It teaches us about Trump try, trying to delay everything and keep it all in the air and keep it in chaos. And then part of his grand strategy. And I think that's a thread for the show. Um, so we're, we're talking today about, you know, people he embedded in his government um, to uh, undermine democracy, undermine the work of the various agencies involved. Uh, so uh, let's start again with you, Tim. I mean, what strikes your recollection as to the kinds of things that Trump was doing um, back in what, November, December, uh, 2020 and thereafter, um, to try to slow things down so that Biden couldn't get his hands around the government and how to be president and all those executive decisions and access to information and so forth. Well, I remember distinctly that um, the Trump administration was not going to give Joe Biden the briefings and they delayed that. Uh, we, before the show, we talked about how GSA um, refused to accept the findings of the election. And so they, were, um, they weren't taking action for a, a, a transition from the Trump administration to the new Biden administration. Uh, those are, those uh, put President Biden on a slow footing. And I'm sure there was information that he didn't have at his disposal. So it either delayed him from making good decisions or he made decisions without the knowledge of that information. And maybe the decisions weren't as good as they ought to have been. Uh, Afghanistan comes to mind. Was there any, any kind of intel reports about Afghanistan that were purposely uh, withheld from Joe Biden and his, his, his administration? And that um, came into a cataclysmic decision on how they exited Afghanistan, which as we all know was a disaster. Yeah, only a few months later. Um, what, what about you, Stephanie? What, what sticks in your mind about the, uh, what do you want to call it, the imperfect uh, transfer of power uh, at that time? Well, in addition to those activities he was pursuing in the interim today during the committee meeting, we also knew that he issued a direct order to the Pentagon to remove all U.S soldier president presence in Afghanistan and in um we are someplace else I think in Africa and uh and it, they were to come out immediately um what and and there and that was the Pentagon had that challenge as to how they were going to move around that because it would have been even more of a disaster to bring all the troops back home um based on that command um during during his uh waiting period. So it's it just this thoughtless knee-jerking and impe impetuosity, impulsiveness that that is how he operated. I don't know, I was going to say governed, but you know, he's not governing, he's thoughtless. And uh, he's just seeking actions that he be believes will perpetuate his power or show his power. Um, and I find it's completely um, 
it is demoralizing and that we've had to endure this and and that the the, the devastation that it has um done to our institutions and to all of the norms. So I, I'm kind of like without words after seeing, uh, you know, the revelations of the committee today that, you know, just continue to build the case for his complete and utter insufficiency for these responsibilities. Now, don't forget Germany. He removed most of the American troops from Germany um, during what, the last few months of his, uh, his administration. And, and that's really ironic because uh, had they stayed there, it would have been a different calculus uh, for Vladimir Putin and his attack on Ukraine um, to have American troops in Germany. But we Jay, Jay, can I follow up with Stephanie on a question here? Yeah, please. Stephanie, you mentioned that you know Donald Trump was thoughtless as usual, impulsive. But was it really thoughtless, or or was it as the show title suggests? Uh, sabotage, intentional sabotage uh, to make Joe Biden and his administration look bad. What do you think? Oh, I think that's very insightful because everything he does look, looks loosey goosey on the surface, mm -hmm. you know, and he just has good luck. But there's a degree of uh, intellect at work there as to how it's going to be messy and how it is going to it's going to be put, putting the BBs out, you know, dumping all the, the uh, ball bearings all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. So um, after the, the after effects, so I think you're absolutely right. Anything to make it more difficult for Biden to come in and pick up, pick up wherever he needed to. So that that's what's going on. And I just, uh, I my th thinking is that the next questions have to have to do with what what can be done about all of this, and can it, can Humpty Dumpty be put back together again here, and and uh, I see that as the biggest challenge and uh, uh, daunting, most daunting, um, more daunting than putting Germany back together after World War II. I mean, it's really a big mess because of what he has done and. Uh, whether he's done it, as you say, um, intellectually pointed to have these effects, or if he's just got some kind of crazy luck, or just his destructiveness is the sort of thing that's that completely um, eviscerates whatever it aims for. So I know I'm a little bit uh, overcome by the effects. I and think the we're good all overcome. Topic. Yeah, yeah, so such a good Cynthia, topic. I want to go to you on something that that pops up on this. You know, we have never heard from Trump as to why he stole those documents. He's never explained it. He's never given a reason for it. And so we, we really have to speculate. And we speculate that, well, maybe he wanted to use them as leverage. Maybe he wanted to give them away to our enemies or sell them to our enemies. Maybe he just wanted to uh, tell some of his guests at Mar-a-Lago what a big boy he was and that he had war plans. Maybe he was just stamping his feet as, as any seven-year-old might might do that, but there's one other thing, you know. If you if you um, go to Tim's point about how maybe this was all quite intentional, um, you wonder if this was another part of Trump's effort to sabotage the Biden administration, taking away documents, many of which were classified, um, and at the same time stopping through through uh, Emily Murphy in the GSA. Uh, stopping the transition in in in, in money in, in information uh, in recognition uh, for a month anyway back in the end of uh, 2020, and so uh, why not also take all the documents? It, you know, it's hard to replace them if you can replace them at all, and you leave your successor with a with a big headache about trying to figure out what was going on at the highest level of security. What do you think, Cynthia? Is that is that a uh, a possibility. I think everything was absolutely intentional without any doubt at all. And I need to just add one thing to the Afghanistan thing that people constantly leave out of the whole picture. He released all of the Taliban prisoners. They, even the leaders were put back in place so that the Taliban was able to take over in a minute. So some of those documents that he had down in Mar-a-Lago could have been, you know, uh, journaling and, and documenting the kind of deals that he made or Pompeo made on his behalf with the Taliban. 
So I think everything he was intending to do that he did during that lane Dex duck ses session was absolutely intent to derail Biden's presidency, to make him look bad. Look at how bad his, um, his approval rating just tank after Afghanistan. When in reality, as Trump, you know, puts out there, oh, it never would have happened if I was there. Well, yeah, nobody would have been able to get out. He would have just abandoned the Afghanistan people, the Afghani people, the same way he abandoned the Kurds. And, and I believe it was all set up to absolutely make Trump look, I mean, to make Biden look bad. And I think that every document that he took had that intention. How can I use this? I don't think there's any one thing that we can point to and be, be firm on, right? I think there's all of the above to sell them, to use them for leverage, to use them to you know tank Biden's presidency, all of the above, and to hide his own guilt. Let's not forget about all of the nasty, horrible, underhanded things that he did while he was president. Those, there was some proof of those things. Most of them he flushed down the toilet, but some of them got saved. And so I think that that, that is also another reason, just to cover his own butt. Remember, we've heard it's been leaked that he took all of the documents from the Mueller investigation. He's got them. Well, I don't know if he still has them, but they do know that there are still documents missing. And that's an important factor that we need to not ever forget. Yeah. Well, you know, some of, some of this we have to speculate about and we have to treat it as circumstantial, but there's other very direct evidence, Tim, um, of uh, people who were saying that he was affirmatively, um, you know, undermining the government in no uncertain terms. One of those uh, was um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Berman, uh, who recently, uh, who was the um, United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, a Trump, a Trump uh, appointee as such, uh, who recently wrote a book and has been on the media. The book is called Holding the Line. Very credible guy uh, who says that uh, Trump tried throughout Berman's time as U.S. Attorney to undermine him and to make the Southern District of New York a weapon um, for uh, Trump's political aspirations uh, consistently. And consistently, Berman refused. Uh, and then William Barr approached Berman and tried to get him out of there, and Berman refused to get out of there. Um, but, but in the book and in his public statements, Berman has said um, that he did the same thing with other United States attorneys who succumbed to these demands uh, for uh, loyal loyalty to Trump and to do Trump's bidding. And this is very scary because the Department of Justice is supposed to be independent. Um, and we have hard evidence that it was not being independent uh, through Barr and through Trump himself. Uh, so Berman's book, you know, that's hard copy. Uh, and we have other hard copy uh, information like, to me, uh, what happened with the uh, Secret Service on January 6th and the loss of those records. There's no good explanation for that. Um, and various other agencies that Trump hollowed out. I mean, uh, the, the book and the movie about uh, James Comey and Trump's uh, successful attempts to replace the whole, the whole cadre at the uh, FBI uh, was, is hard copy. So, Tim, I mean, you know, sometimes it's circumstantial. Sometimes it's, it's hard copy. Are there other indications of hard copy that you can think of that, that uh, you know, suggest or prove uh, that, that Trump was undermining the government for his own um, political aspirations, but also to undermine Biden. Oh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is just before the <clears throat> November 2020 election, the presidential election, look at, look at uh, Louis DeJoy from the United States Postal Service did. And I'm sure under the instructions and the loyalty to Donald Trump, he basically tried to trash every, um, bulk processing machinery so that would impede the uh, delivery um, of mail-in ballots 
Remember that? That was in the news for a week and a half. And why was DeJoy picking literally a month and a half before the election to dismantle all this equipment that couldn't be remet, you know, could be put back together again quickly. And in a lot of cases, um, the machinery was trashed. And then remember the drop boxes that were being taken from certain rural areas and certain cities, uh, the mail-in <clears throat> drop boxes. So that comes to mind immediately. But if you really look at, you know, if you step back and take a look at the picture, Jay, you know, it's funny, I, I saw a, a think tech show that um, I think it was called Trump Week and it was dated November, 2017. Uh, not soon after Trump has been in office. And by gosh, didn't we just talk about it on that show? We were we wearing different Aloha shirts, but we said Trump is taking steps to replace people and replace them with loyalists. So we called it dead on that that was his mission. Isn't that the mission of every fascist autocrat is to take, you know, try to install those not necessarily dedicated to the mission of their agency, but install those people, those personnel that are loyal to me, the president of the United States, and to that only. Forget your oath of office, you're loyal to me, Donald Trump. And that's what he did. And that's what he tried to do with Comey. Uh, so it's, it's no surprise that we have several agencies that probably are still infected with those loyalists. And how do you root them out? I mean, I think you have to be very careful because you don't wanna be a Joseph McCarthy and say, we have a red scare, we have, you know, all our agencies are, are, are rifled with, uh, you know, Trump loyalists that are working against democracy in the federal government. So we have to be very careful about how we proceed about identifying who's actually dragging their feet and, and trying to throw sand in the gears uh, to foil the current administration of Joe Biden. Well, according to the Bremen book, there are some U.S. attorneys in the country who were appointed by Trump and who are still there. Okay. Um, are, are they trying to throw Shen in the gears, though? That's the question. Maybe they're sleepers, Tim. Uh, this is a big problem. You know, when it gets to the crunch, you call upon the sleepers. You call upon your loyalists who may not actually uh, show it or admit it, but they're there and they belong to you. And I think we have to consider that, the sleepers out there in government. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. How, how do we avoid becoming like the Joseph McCarthy's uh, of today and you know, start um, not creating a red, a red scare, but a Trump scare. How do we, how do we address that if, if these sleepers, as you suggest, um, start to throw sand in the gears of democracy? How, how, do we, how do we walk that balance, that fine line? You know, by that time, I'm sorry to say, I think it'd be too late. Too late? Okay. I mean, well, it, 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 it's, it's person by person, agency by agency, but it may well be too late. I want to raise one other point with you, and that is um, that sometimes during the Trump administration, and this goes to the FCC, which you and I have talked about many times, um, Trump had a huge effect on the FCC. Uh, and I've read a, a number of articles about this fellow Pi, P-A-I, who he appointed as the chair of the uh, PUC. Now, Pi's not there, any FCC rather, um, uh, FCC. Uh, the the pie's not there anymore. Um, but the policies that he put in about broadband avail availability uh, to underprivileged uh, communities um, are still in there. And these articles end with statements like, um, Pi created a problem. It will take years for us to fix. Uh, he deprived various communities that Trump didn't like uh, with broadband availability. So th there's, there's an example of not a person who's a sleeper, but a policy that's a sleeper. Mm -hmm. And it was put in place by Trump or a Trump uh, you know, appointee loyalist. Um, and it's still there because it's hard to unwind it. So uh, it's not only you know, these time bombs in terms of people and sleepers, it's these time bombs in terms of policies that were intentional and were intentionally hard to unwind. Yeah? This is really interesting. And in answer to your question, I, I think it's hard to unwind them. Mm -hmm. It's going to take years to clean it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but Stephanie, you know, you mentioned um, that there's a question as to why any of this is still there. 
And, the, and that raises the question as to whether Joe Biden has done the right thing, has done enough to clean house. What's your thought about that? Well, I thought my thought about that good question is uh, the current situation we have with him moving on up the road from one judge to another judge that was his appointee. So, you know, you talk about putting these sleepers in. Well, certainly McConnell and the Republicans have made that happen with the judges. And so, but what what turns it on? In other words, he went up the road to get this judge that was Trump appointee. And of course, she's played the game with him, done all his bidding to the point of potentially losing any reputation or, or, or having any respect for the work she's doing. So when when that but there are others that haven't done that so you know he's put as you say he's put these sleepers in there certainly through this uh you know bringing these judges uh, online that have no business and no experience so right there we have you, quite you a, wouldn't be referring to eileen cannon would I'm you talking about the gun yeah cannon okay. right that's the one okay so she and what did he have to do to light her off so um that, but not all of them do go that way. And of course, the Supreme Court didn't today either when they ruled against him. But you're, you're right. Um, we have that to deal with. But what, what's the, the uh, pushback on, on, on canon? So it's the 11th Circuit, right? So we're back to depending on the remaining institutions or the, the, the remaining <laughs> functioning institutions that will, will hold the line on it. And also the peer group. I mean, none of the other judges or people that are interested in that case of Cannon have held back on her. I mean, she's she's just been riddled with criticism. So in that case, she's coming up against it. But I mean, your question is so good because there, there are hundreds of those out there. And it, not only the judges, but in all these other um, deep, the deep state or in the executive branch, they've been branch, they've they've uh, They've dug in and they have, uh, you know, and they're still there. So I don't know that there's anything to do. I mean, how- Well, what, what can Joe Biden do? Are you saying he can't do anything? I mean, I, you know, I, I liken him to the Marquise de Queensberry. Uh, you know, he doesn't want to attack anybody, doesn't want to disagree with anybody. So he uh, lets them do uh, what they do. And that includes agencies. It includes uh, you know, Trump appointees like the Joy. Um, and it, it, you know, it includes judges like, uh, you know, Trump would be criticizing uh, uh, Eileen uh, Cannon. Uh, sh should Biden do that? Um, and, and let me add that in the hour before we had a, a show uh, with a, um, a, a Indian, an Indian uh, author uh, who told us about Modi, uh, the prime minister. Now there's good things and bad things about Modi, but uh, what she told us was Modi does fireside chats, uh, just like FDR used to do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Modi connects with the people, not only in India, but the Indian diaspora. I mean, he talks to all Indians on a regular basis, one-on-one, -on -one, using radio and TV. Um, and he comments on how things are going. We're not getting that uh, well, from Biden. We're not, we get these one-liners. Like Henny Youngman, remember Henny Youngman? Yeah. <laughs> but we're not we're not getting some real some real you know um, uh, communication from Biden. Could could Biden do better? Well, I think Jay he has been doing that actually. I've been delighted that he has come out to talk about what he has done. The last week he had a show on what he has done. He's come out before the public and 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 on national TV. So it wasn't called a fireside chat, but I think Biden is trying to get something like that done. I think the game, the the agenda right now is he wants to make sure everybody knows what he's done, how much he's done. But he also has talked about the issue of democracy and how this is the attempt to serve. So I'm saying, yes, you're right. I think, yes, we need him to do more of that. I see him as having done it a couple of times and hope that he's going to keep on going with that. I think the plan is for him to do that. Okay, and Cynthia, really your, your comments on the same question. Oh, gosh. Well, um, I'd, I'd like for him to come out more, and I'd like him to be more forceful. But I have something more important that goes to the subject matter of today that we're talking about all these leftover plants and people. There was an email that was leaked. It has been um, 
certified by the NBC and they released it in the news today. It was an email sent to Paul Abate, I'm not sure if I, Abate, I'm not sure if I pronounce his name right, but DO FBI is his title. And in this email, I'm just not gonna tell you everything, but he does say, I'm sorry, I know how busy you are after all this you know, inauguration week, blah, blah, blah. But he says, this is so important that I had to bother you with it. He says right here that uh, conversations from January 6th, there is at best a sizable percentage of employee population that felt sympathetic to the group that stormed the Capitol and said it was no different than the BLM protests of last summer. Several also lamented that the only reason this violent activity is getting more attention is because of political correctness. Here's a sampling of what happened across multiple field offices. I literally had to explain, wait, wait, where'd it go? Um, to a blue state office, the difference between opportunists burning and looting during protests that stemmed from legitimate grievance to police brutality versus an, insur an insurgent mob whose purpose was to prevent the execution of de democratic processes at the behest of a sitting president. Okay, I was talking to an ASSA in a red state office who was telling me that over 70%, this is scary, 70% of his CT squad and roughly 75% of the agent population in his office disagreed, but could understand, disagreed with the violence, but could understand where the frustration was coming from and led to the protesters getting carried away. An analyst in a purple state described watching horrified as the events were unfolded on the news while several coworkers chalked up the insurgency as a response to everyone being quarantined at home for months and more on edge because so many lost their jobs. It was all because of COVID. This is an internal memo, inter, inter, I mean, an internal email from the FBI trying to really look into how many of these guys are out there that think it's okay what happened, that aren't gonna oh, really wow. do good investigations and are going to undermine anything that Merrick Garland wants to try and do or Biden wants to do or people that believe in truth and democracy want to do. Kim, you know, this, this all suggests that, that uh, Trump's biggest legacy time bomb um, uh, is the divisiveness in the country the politicization of every issue you can think of and, and still happening. Um, this was not unintentional in my view, um, but if you look at the insurrection, we know enough now to know that this was a huge conspiracy and Trump uh, followers were organizing it. Arguably, he was organizing all of it at the Willard Hotel and otherwise through, through his acolytes. Um, and I guess the question I, and I put to you is, uh, is, is that a time bomb too? Um, is the, the, call it the hardening uh, of, of, of the base of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the people who were there at the insurrection, um, are, are they part of the Trump time bomb legacy too? Yes, in a word. <laughs> uh, you know, January 6th was really just the, um, a preamble to what's the potentially coming again. And you know, I was watching the January 6th uh, hearing committee and they said, we're doing this to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, but I, I'm thinking that you still have these same people. And as Cynthia suggested, uh, the rank and file goes deep on, on Trump loyalists. And uh, remember, after January 6th, the military had to do its house cleaning as best they could to find out the hardcore, you know, um, sympathetic Proud Boys, Oath Keepers in the, the ranks of the military. But well, that's it's, great it's for the rank of clear that's over. That's 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 my point. That is my point. And also, it's not clear. You know, they got rid of the rank and file, the lower non-commissioned officers. 
how many commission officers were um, sent packing because of their extreme views and their published views? How many? I don't think many. So, you know, we, we still, this is 2022. Uh, 2024 still remains. And uh, this shows, at, you know, very correctly titled um, sabotage. And, you know, how, how do we know those that are embedded in existing agencies and the military and the FBI and the Secret Service, uh, we just don't know if they're still there and they're still uh, haven't come to their senses that following Donald Trump to whatever means is not a good idea. Yeah, wow. So Stephanie, it goes, it really does go beyond fireside chats and communicating with the public and all that and, and, and being uh, strident in responding to Trump's, uh, you know, unhinged remarks, which we get every day and which I worry about we're getting, we will be getting on Twitter uh, when, um, uh, when uh, that, that transaction is closed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but I, my question to you, uh, Stephanie, is what can we do about this? I mean, I, I think it's clear from this discussion that it's plenary. It's through the government agencies, through very important, powerful agencies. It's through these threats um, that he has made and is making and his, you know, uh, uh, his, uh, his calls for violence and all that. Um, it's through these people he has appointed and, and he somehow controls them. It's through the divisiveness. And it's through the fact that up till this point, Joe Biden hasn't been able to really clean house for whatever reason. What do we do now? Because these things that we've been talking about, the sabotage, the time bombs, they're, they're really existential threats to the country and to all of us. What do we do? Well, as we watched the committee today, we saw Pelosi and McConnell and Schumer and the guy that was shot at the baseball game, all, all of them there gathered in a little huddle calling the governor of Virginia, calling the governor of Maryland, calling the Pentagon, calling Muriel Bowser for the D.C. police. And uh, nobody was sending anybody right in. So my question is, are we going to get that in place? Is anybody doing anything about if 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 Trump is indicted by Garland and as a gift to the nation that we well deserve, and then we have this hoorah again, have we replaced, have we strengthened and hardened, as Tim says, have we strengthened and hardened our defenses against something like this again? Um, and to see that covey of our nation's leaders calling out for help because of the people's safety and their concerns about uh, people's injuries and life. And uh, Pelosi talking about she didn't care what it took to clean up all the the caca poo poo all over the place. She only cared about getting, keeping people safe. I was shocked that nobody was coming in. It was all, oh, uh, well, we got 150 people getting their uniforms on and they're getting over to the border. So this was shocking to me to see our leaders not, and also not, and, and calling the vice president, the vice president they called, and he was the only one that did say much about what was gonna happen. And, but no, of course not the president because he wasn't gonna help at all. They never even reached out to him only to the vice president. And these are our esteemed leaders. I, mean, I was shocked when I saw that today. No, and they're not, they're not much leaders, honestly. So Cynthia, you know, we have two major uh, possible indictments, okay? Actually three, uh, to include the one in Georgia. Okay? Um, so we may have an indictment uh, out of the, the work of the select committee uh, on January 6th. Um, we may have an indictment uh, over Mar-a-Lago. We may have an indictment um, with Rappensberger in, in Georgia. Um, those three, okay? I'm asking you about whether those indictments or any of them are going to help us clean house. Well, I would like to hope that it would, but I'm afraid that this problem is so much bigger than Donald Trump now. All these people that have 
um, you know, sitting members of Congress. So you have to go against them too. You can't just say, okay, you've already displayed evidence of being a Trumper, you're out. But the thing that, you know, we talked about all the different agencies that were called and just like a firehouse, they are able to go and fight fires that are in their district. But if they're going to go to another district to fight a fire, they have to get permission from that district first. So whoever was sitting in the catbird seat, controlling all those different agencies, like we knew the one guy that came out all the time, what was his name? Uh, he was the DC uh, uh, National Guard and he said he was ready. They were all, you know, suited up and on the line waiting for the approval to go. So it was that one person there that was not giving the permission to all these people to be able to come in. It's not like they were all sitting on their hands going, well, what are we gonna do? They couldn't go until they got that permission. So, you know, let's do some research and find out who was the man in the power for that position. Oh, could have been Mike wasn't Flynn's it? brother. His brother, yeah, thank you. You took the words right out of my mouth. And wasn't that Mike Flynn's brother? There was the, that, and is he gone? I don't know. I tried to look it up before for today's show. I don't think he, he's don't in know. Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. He's in Hawaii. So he's not even gone. He's Aloha. Still yeah. So is he, oh, he is he fat, is he doing his military position there? Yes. The same, yeah. He's in charge of um the sink pack something. Pacific, yeah. 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 That's, in charge that's scary, of Tim, especially in favor uh, in, in view of your comment and mine. Uh, about the uh, the compromise of the American military, right. which was clear, which was clear on uh, January sixth, and in other ways too. Right. Um, Where was anyway, let, me, let me move on, uh, Cynthia. Um, uh, Tim, you know, uh, really the same question, I suppose. Uh, are any of these um, indictments or possible indictments going to affect uh, the time bombs, the sabotage? Uh, are they going to clean house or or not? Um, and, and I guess part of that question is, are we going to get three indictments out of those three cases? You know, let me kind of just compare the indictment to, if you will, in a, in a lawsuit, uh, punitive damages award. What's the purpose of punitive damage awards? It's to teach those in the future, think twice before you commit this crime. An indictment is going to send, I hope, the same message to any would-be despot, would-be um, fascist wannabe, autocrat wannabe, that thinks they can come in and try to usurp the power from a democratic system of governance. And that an indictment, we may not get a conviction, but we're gonna get an indictment. And I think uh, Merrick Garland's gonna get that at least on the Mar-a-Lago document case. I'm not sure about what happens with the, Warren, um, the Georgia uh, election, um, trying to get the 11,780 votes, but I think we get an indictment on the documents and it will send a message to those who are in government now that are Trump loyalists, that maybe they should keep their head down and not spark up when they think they have the opportunity or else they may be on the indictment list in the future. So I think that's the value of an indictment. And I think we're going to get one. I, I think we, all, we always have to build in the time frame. Here we are, we're three weeks away from election day. Um, and a fair chance that both houses will be controlled um, by Republicans and Republican. Oh, no. uh, no. oh we have heads shaking. No. Okay, well, I'm, uh, let me no, put it this way then. Winning. Uh, the result a of the election. Winning. Uh, the relent. Okay. <laughs> be a yaysayer, not a naysayer, Jay. <laughs> Definitely, you may have to save me on this. Uh, so. <laughs> My question is, is, is the result of the elections coming soon, you know, and the reseating of Congress, if you will, on January 1, how does that affect, um, you know, these, these time bombs and sabotage points? Tim first. Just, every, well, very clearly, I mean, obviously, if your prediction comes true, they'll be, uh, feel more emboldened, but they're not gonna get the Senate. Right. They may get the House, but they're but not it, gonna get the Senate. And by the way, don't forget the power of veto. Well, the other point is that if there, if we go to psychology, if uh, we do win, and as we're supposed to, the Democrats, 
Um, but even if we don't, as the power of Trump is no longer available, it's got to start diminishing and people don't receive any of those goodies or that power base or, um, you know, it, it, it starts to dissipate. And that that's one hopeful thing about all of these sleepers and everything uh, that you mentioned. But I think uh, the people have got to stand up and vote. And if people don't come out and vote in this election and, and make it happen to get us back on our feet, we are screwed, if I can say that on on streaming you just I mean, did we are screwed. <laughs> i'm saying it again so um that's what my, I, i'm ready to reset um uh as to how the election comes out and not get too bothered you know between now and then but i do even but even at the even if they win a house or one of the chambers we've still got the issue of pat the, the power and strength and influence of trump is, is it going to ebb after that well, I mean, just rem remember, if Elon Musk has his way and <clears throat> closes that deal, he has said he's going to let Trump back on Twitter. I agree. It's Trump's okay. favorite platform and it is an important factor in the calculus here. It is very important. I, I hate it. I hate it. Why did he have to get into this? But he's still in trouble on that deal. It's not for sure yet. Okay. He'd have to admit that his social platform was a failure. He doesn't like that idea either. Yeah, that's, well, uh, that's true, but it nevertheless, is a failure. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. let's let's go for uh, let's go for final comments. Uh, let's start with you, Cynthia. Um, uh, how how uh, how do you feel about the the time bombs, um, the sabotage, uh, and how they will affect us going forward? And what, if anything, uh, anybody can do about it? Well, I think it is imperative that everyone get out and vote like Stephanie said. Um, and even then we have to remember we've got eight battleground states that already have all their election power given to the legislature. So we may be in trouble there too, right? Um, we, I'm like Stephanie too, we have to kind of take a breath and sit back as we wait for this Next time, I feel sort of breathless every day as I wait to find out what's going to be the outcome, you know, because it's going to radically change. If we keep the House and the Senate, we'll be okay. But if we lose the House and the Senate, we're, as Stephanie so apropos said, yeah, we're screwed. So I agree with her. In okay, well, let's move on. Wait, 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 what are your... wait, wait, my last quote, my last thing is a quote. I shouldn't have said anything without doing my quote. This is what I should have just said at the end. This is a quote from Judge Amy Berman Jackson. Um, High ranking members of Congress and state officials who know perfectly well the claim of fraud was and is untrue and that the election was legitimate are so afraid of losing their own power, they won't say so. It has to be crystal clear that it is not patriotism. It is not standing up for America to stand up for one man who knows full well that he lost instead of the constitution he was trying to subvert. Yeah, here, 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 here. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, don't tell me to vote. I already know that I have to vote. Give me some pro profound statement for your closing remark. Oh, well, we've got a long way back. Let's see. Yeah, we've we've got um, we've got to see more people come out in this election than in the last. And at that one the presidential election, we've got to have more out so that there's an unassailable uh, uh, number of votes from for for uh, continuing with Bob whatever we're voting on this time around and i'm just so I'm, I'm kind of it's so bothering me it's hard to even um express it but anyway that's where i am and if we don't if if america if americans are not going to take the time and make the effort to be americans to the core which is to vote then uh we we are going into the dark ages and it's going to be a long route back out i don't know 
So I wish I had something more profound, but I see that that's where we are. That's what it is, because to come back out with the houses gone over to the other side, they're going to spend all their time doing absolutely no legislation for the people. It's all going to be political payback and political. And uh, so we're going to continue to to, to go head down the hill. Our institute. And, and the worst of it is that while we while we're engaged in this this clench where we, we can't do anything. The Congress is dysfunctional. Done. The courts are dysfunctional. We can't make policy. Uh, we can't make policy for our role in the world, which is another critical issue for us. Um, and so it's, it's, it doesn't look so good. But, but Tim, maybe, maybe I have to go to Tim now, Stephanie. Yeah, okay. Uh, Just the numbers have to be big. The numbers have got to be the biggest ever to avoid any concerns about you know, not having enough. Pain. About lawsuits. There'll be lawsuits. You know that. So, so Tim, I mean, how big do, do the numbers have to be to avoid the lawsuits? Is it possible to avoid the lawsuits? It depends on how many, as this show suggested, how many sleepers are waiting to their opportunity to pounce and try to delegitimize a democratic free and fair election. But I go to my statement, and that is the Department of Justice will determine whether or not that no one is above the law in this country, especially a former president. And if there are sleepers in various agencies waiting to pounce, they will take pause if the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, is indicted, because they will think, maybe that could happen to me, and maybe it'll give them pause, and they will not act against our government and democracy of our government. Right. And the flip side of that, before we go, is that if he is not indicted, there's a message there too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Stephanie. Very interesting discussion. One to watch because it's not over. It's still happening. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.